My guest today is Steve Andrews. Steve, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm, uh, it's a little past my bedtime right now in Chicago, but it's worth it to talk to you, my friend. I appreciate you staying up for me. What are you working on these days? Oh, so a lot of my work is centered around what I call um, the science of feeling safe and why it really matters. I'm fascinated by the human nervous system and how it relates to how we think and feel and act as human beings. And today I thought we might talk about that in the context of leadership. I'd love to. One of the core patterns. So I, I found human behavior is a lot like chaos theory where it seems disordered and unpredictable, but the more I study and learn patterns start to emerge. And one of the patterns that started to emerge is that good leaders help individuals and teams feel safe. And I'd like to illustrate this using what's known as the hand model of the brain, which is popularized by Dr. Daniel Siegel. Hmm. And so our brain influences how we think and act, how we behave and interact with others. And the hand model of the brain kind of shows a simplified logical structure of the brain. And it starts out pretty simple with just a hand. Okay. And so our wrist is our spinal cord and the base of the hand is our brain stem. And that's our hind brain. It's kind of our primal reptilian brain. Uh, it also includes the cerebellum and it includes our basic survival instincts. Okay. Moving forward, we pull the thumb in and that re represents the midbrain, our emotional or limbic brain, which is the amygdala, the hippocampus, structures like that. And it's responsible largely for emotions and reactions. And then moving forward, we pull our hand over and now this structure is our thinking brain, our forebrain, our neocortex, which is that, that um, the part of the brain you see when you see a model of the brain. Okay. Right, the folded over part. And it's about two thirds of our brain mass and that's our cerebral cortex. And then right down here on our fingertips is our prefrontal brain. So our prefrontal brain is our executive function, our um, higher order behavior, yeah, cognitive things thinking. like, yeah, things like long term consequences and resisting immediate temptation and executive function, decision making, goal directed behaviors. All those things are here in our prefrontal cortex, hmm. uh, social behavior, emotional regulation, empathy, moral reasoning, all the kind of higher order thinking is in this executive center. So the part that, that's proactive. I think everything else is described as sort of reactive, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good way to think about yeah. it. And this is physically how the brain is actually structured, that you're actually building a little model of the parts of the brain? It's sort of. Okay. It's, it's overly simplistic, okay. obviously. The brain has many structures, and there's numerous different ways to categorize and think about the brain. But um, as a really simplistic example, to think about it in those three parts of our hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain, and then prefrontal, uh, helps us understand some concepts around behavior that tie directly into leadership. Oh, yeah. So what, what does this have to do with leadership? So one of the first um, concepts to understand here is the idea of there's a fun term called neuroception. And neuroception, in school, we're taught about the five basic human senses, right? S touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing, right? But our bodies actually have dozens of senses, and one of them is called neuroception. What is that? And neuroception, which was coined by Dr. Stephen Porges, is our sense of safety or danger. Hmm. It's a part of our brain that's scanning our sensory input, scanning our environment and saying, am I safe or am I in danger? Right. So it, right now you and I are both indoors. You know, we have walls to keep out the bears, <laughs> you know, a roof to keep out the rain. Chicago bears. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so. Subjectively, or subjectively speaking, we are very safe. I feel safe, yes. But it, yeah, but people may not always feel safe, and and so neuroception is a very individualistic. So therefore, everyone feels safe. They may or may not, but neuroception is really important because when we detect danger, going back to our hand model, the first thing that happens—you've heard the term "flip your lid." I've heard that term. 
happens. It goes like this. Our so it like physically goes like that? No, not physically. Our heads would be shaped very differently. <laughs> oh, so, so you're saying that uh, different parts of our brain take over. That's right. So normally when we're feeling safe and social and, and whatnot, you know, we're in this state of being governed largely by the prefrontal cortex and the cerebral cortex. When we sense danger, yeah. we kind of flip our lid, if you will, and the midbrain takes over. And the midbrain is our, I sense a danger, my brain, my nervous system detects a danger and I'm going to mobilize. And so that's where we get the fight or flight. So fl fight is mobilized towards the danger, right? I'm going to go punch the bear in the nose. Not generally a good idea, but you know, you could, um, flight says I'm going to run away uh, from the bear, that's, uh... right? I'm going to retreat from the bear. I'm going to retreat from the danger. But sometimes our brains determine that mobilization is not going to protect us. And so we go back down to the hind brain, which is our primal reptilian brain. And that's what we call in polyvagal theory, it's dorsal vagal. And it's basically immobilization. It says, I can't defeat this danger by running away or by fighting it. I'm stuck. I'm trapped. And so we get into things like immobilization, freeze, flop, disassociation, withdrawal, shutdown, behaviors like that. Yeah. Like deer in the headlights is an expression I hear. Yeah. Describes that. Right. It's that freeze response of, I don't know what to do to handle this danger that I'm facing. And it's not always visceral things like an actual bear standing in front of us. It could be conflict with another person. It could be a danger in our social social circle or economics or our financial situation. Any number of aspects we could sense, we could feel unsafe. And again, this is all very. Well, let's bring this around to leadership. What does what does that have to do with leadership? Yeah, one of the um, one of the difficult nuances in psychology, of course, is that everyone is the same, and equally, everyone is different. <laughs> okay, sounds like a paradox to me. Indeed, but safety comes into play. Uh, it's it's super critical in the workplace as well. And we're generally not, unless you're a zookeeper, you're generally not facing actual bears at work, but we often face threats at work from coworkers, from right. teams, from managers, from responsibilities, from deadlines. There's all sorts of threats. And so, it, and it's not always a drastic display of I'm going to run out of the building, but emotionally, psychologically, people can mobilize or immobilize against these threats as well. And what I found is that one of the keys to leadership is great leaders prioritize making their team members and uh, their teams and individuals feel safe. In many ways, leadership is about setting the emotional tone for a team. So one of the things I've developed over the past uh, number of years, as I've kind of stepped a little farther and farther away outside of technology and more into this, uh, what I call emotional well-being and understanding of, of the human sciences is I've developed a neurosocial model of emotional well-being, which looks at what are the dimensions of people being able to thrive, of people feeling safe and social, uh, of people being able to live rich and fulfilling lives. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd go through the 10 dimensions of this model and break out 10, point, 10, 10 leadership principles from each of the dimensions. And the first one at the very core. Let's start just by listing them. Can we just list them first and then we'll go through them one at a time? Sure. Safety, identity, messages, agency, positive social connection, environment, mission and purpose, body and brain, human needs, and strengths. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned safety. Is a re There's a reason that safety is number one, I'm going to guess. Yeah, at the root of everything, at the root of all human behavior. And in fact, you, one way to view human behavior is through the lens of if I do X or I don't do Y, then I will be safe. Hmm. And it's more than just physical safety. I mean, it's, it's easy to talk about bears and physical safety, but there's there. And that's the most basic form of safety, of course. Um, but there's also psychological safety. 
you know, creating an environment where individuals feel comfortable expressing themselves and taking risks and being vulnerable. There's emotional safety, which is closely related to psychological safety, but it focuses specifically on protecting individuals from emotional harm. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone has experienced some emotional harm at work at one point or another. Oh, preaching to the choir. Yeah. And then there's cognitive. now, but not too long ago. Yeah. And I, I have stories I could tell as well. Um, cognitive safety is another one. And it's really about intellectual safety, right? Am I, uh, is, am I in an environment that supports intellectual growth and learning, right? Can I voice my opinions, explore new ideas without fear of criticism or humiliation or suppression of intellectual capabilities? Am I intellectually safe? And there's interpersonal safety, right? And are, am I safe in my well-being, in my relationships with others? And are others safe in their relationship with me, right? It goes both ways. Um, it involves fostering an environment where people can engage in healthy, respectful, non-abusive interactions, um, bullying, that kind of thing, we, we, sure. right? And that's even in the midst of change, you know, I, I've heard a number of companies recently that, are, that have been doing rolling layoffs. And what a what an assault to people's emotional safety, right? There's a big fear of, sure. am I next? Am I going to have a job? If not, how, am I going to find another one in this market? How am I going to support my family? And when all that fear creeps in, remember when when we go to mobilization or immobilization, we're not in the part of the brain that does our good work, right? So yeah. productivity suffers as a result cooperation, collaboration, all those things suffer when we're in those situations where we don't feel safe in the broad spectrum of safety. I've seen that. There's been a lot of layoffs recently in my company and yeah. folks are looking over their shoulder and um, you don't do your best work when that happens. Right. Yeah. But let's let's move on. We have limited time here. I want to go through as many of these points as we can. Uh, identity is the next one you mentioned. Talk yeah. that, please. So identity asks the question, who am I? And good leaders ensure that their people feel valued and good about who they are. You know, encouraging team members to be their authentic self rather than, you know, there are some environments to try and mold everybody into everybody has to act this way, behave this way. And those people don't feel safe as their authentic selves in that environment. And therefore, they're not going to be able to bring their best to the table. Right. And to give people opportunities to thrive as themselves. And it, and it comes down to even in the, the role of software engineer. So we have these roles of software engineer, junior, mid, senior, those kinds of things. But I, I feel like they're too narrow because no two brains are alike. You know, we try and prescribe, you have to fit in these easily definable buckets. But even among software developers, there are software developers who are great at detail work and really struggle with the big picture. It's just not one of their strengths. Sure. And there's other people who really struggle with the detail, the minute implementation, but they're really great at the big picture. But we call it all software developer. Right? And I think one of the things we can do is start thinking about capabilities rather, rather than roles. How can I use this unique per, this person's unique capability within the organization rather than they have to fit into these siloed roles that they may or may not, right? And as you, you know, as you progress junior, mid, senior, you're expected to do more big picture thinking, but what if that's not your strength? What if there was a progression along the detail line, say, right? Sure, we could avoid the Peter principle by keeping people focused on the things that they are really good at. Yeah, what's, what's the Peter principle? That path. Uh, oh, the Peter principle? Oh, it's, uh, I think it was developed by a fellow named Peter, named Peter. And he <laughs> said that everyone is promoted to their highest level of incompetence. Yeah, and okay. Because they've, they've uh, once you get to that level, you stop doing good work and you don't get promoted anymore. And so you stay there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that assumes that you're moving up in, in one direction until you get to a spot where you're no good. If you've got multiple paths and you can choose the path that's best suited to you, as I think you were advocating, right. that would avoid that. Right. And some people who are great at an individual contributor role may not be great in a manager position, nor would they want it. 
great point. Right? Sure. Number three is messages. Good leaders are conscious about how they communicate and how their messages are received. I'm, I'm a big fan of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. I, I, I often say, I, I often say I want to be more like Mr. Rogers when I grow up. And I believe one of the <laughs> core messages of his work, I have a big collection of quotes and photos of his. And, uh, you know, I, I don't put people on pedestals because there's two ways to dehumanize people to, to tear them down or put them on a pedestal. Right. But he's about as close as I'll get. I have a lot of admiration for who he was. And one of the core things I've picked out of his work is he was really conscious about the messages that children receive and how those messages shape how the child views themselves and the world around them. So much of what he did when he, when he wrote each and every show, every word, every sentence, he really went through to try and, am I communicating the proper message here to a child? And as leaders, we need to be cognizant of the same, right? Clear, open, honest, effective, uh, calm communication, right? Leaders are kind and gentle and gracious. And, you know, if our boss starts yelling at us or acting in a panicky way or they're dramatic, what does that do to our own nervous system, right? There's a post up on my blog talking about a concept of vagal attunement, but the gist is that we're always looking, scanning our environment, scanning each other, looking for cues of are you a safe person or not, right? Our facial expressions, our body language, our tone of voice. And, you know, I've certainly had experience with managers where I felt unsafe based on how they acted, how they communicated. So that's really important to keep in mind, knowing how to, in the midst of crisis, to kind of calm it. Same thing we do with children, right? To kind of calm take a deep breath, yeah. ground, center myself to be able to have a productive interaction with another person. You know, manage. I like the example of uh, Fred Rogers too, because you talk about a guy who brought his authentic self to work. Yeah. He's the epitome of that. Yeah. I like to say that manage, I like to say that managers know leaders listen and learn. You know, point. I'm sure you've had know-it-all managers before. And it's just, it's, it doesn't feel healthy, right? It doesn't feel safe to be in that environment. Uh, ask for feedback. Don't just give it. Resolve conflicts positively and focus on solutions. Uh, you know, if I came to you, let's say you worked for me and you had made a mistake and I came to you and said, you did this wrong, do better. I mean, how does that feel to you? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't feel good. Imagine if I came to you and said, this is a really great start and you're on the right track. Here's how, here's how we can do it better. How does that now feel? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I honestly, I want that feedback. I want, yeah. you know, the whole thing of the agile software development is fail fast. Yeah. <laughs> if you get, if you make a mistake, make a mistake fast, get that feedback and that fast feedback and then correct it. I want that in my personal life as well. I want, I want my manager to tell me when I'm doing something wrong, not in a, you know, in a constructive way though. Yeah. If the first time you hear about a problem is on your, your yearly uh, report, uh, you're, they failed you, right? Yeah. Really be a role model for the behavior you want to see. Great. Number four is uh, a, agency. Yes. What do you mean by that? Good leaders trust and empower their people. So agency, the word means the ability of individuals to make choices and take actions to achieve their goals, to influence and have control over their own lives. You know, at a core level in our brains, we all want to have a measure of control over our own lives, right? If we go to a job and everything is prescribed and we don't get to contribute any of our, power, our knowledge, skills, experience to it, it's not very fulfilling. It doesn't feel intellectually safe at that point, right? Leadership is about giving control, not being controlling. Daniel Pink does a great talk. It's up on YouTube. Uh, it's an RSA animate video called Mastery, Autonomy, and Purpose. And he defines those three things as, the, as really important things people want to have in their careers. So a leader can set goals and directions. You know, a, a leader saying, hey, I'm here if you need any help removing roadblocks or obstacles. I'm here to encourage personal growth and development. You know, really inspiring people to reach their potential. It is really powerful as a leader. And number five is positive social connection. Good leaders foster community 
interdependence and healthy relationships. You know, they really work to build a supportive team culture. Uh, good leaders honestly care deeply about people. You have to care about people in order to take care of people, mm -hmm. right? It's about taking care of the people under our, under our purview, right? One of our core drivers along with, you know, safety and, and control agency is for belonging and community and acceptance. You know, we all want to be part of something and evolutionarily speaking, I mean, being a part of a group was critical for survival sure. and caveman days, you were either part of the group or you were dead. <laughs> yeah. Community was necessary for survival and it's still just as important, even if we don't realize it sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to work to create healthy enough, safe enough community spaces on teams to foster collaboration and team building and to foster healthy conflict resolution. Because anytime we're in community with other people, there is conflict is inevitable. Of course. <laughs> conflict is going to happen, right? And how can we positively resolve those conflicts in a way that strengthens relationships, strengthens understanding of each other, and helps set us up for success in the future? Number six is environment. So good leaders create healthy environments. So it's a good physical and emotional work environment, but it also includes sensory issues. You know, there's a significant number of neurodivergent people out there, sure. autistic, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, who can struggle with the sensory environments at work, light, sound, distractions, you know, lots of motion, competing sounds. Um, you know, are we creating environments where everyone can thrive? Yeah. You know, environment also means shielding people from things outside their control. I find that really good leaders uh, are good at being that kind of um, shield for their people. You know, whether it's conflict above the org or whatever's going on. Um, and they allow people to make mistakes because mistakes are how we learn. Mistakes are learning opportunities. You know, if, if you and I are working together and I make a mistake, uh, sure, I made a mistake, but is it a mistake that you could have easily made as well? Is it an opportunity for all of us to learn how to do better together? Yeah. Right. That's a lot of what they do in air traffic control. Right. Because if one air traffic controller can make a mistake, then any of the others could. And so let's let's up our game and make sure this this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Right. So environment is not only it's the physical environment and then it's also the the, the communication environment, the interpersonal environment. Yeah. Number seven is mission and purpose. We've talked about this a little already. Good leaders inspire and motivate their people. They, they connect the work to a bigger goal. I remember all hands at a, a big company I worked at once where they'd get up there and talk for a couple hours about these are the great things we're doing. And I'd leave going, yeah, but how am I contributing? How does that affect me yeah. and what I do every day? And I never really got the, you know, I got the big 30,000 foot view, but bring it, bring it down for me. Let me know how I'm a part of that and contributing to that. Right. Help the people see the vision and how to get there. Yeah, that's a good point. I find that um, the organizations I've been a part of, uh, big companies, they tend to do a better job among the small teams. Like the, the the small group of a couple hundred people that I belong to do a really good job of communicating that message. The higher up I, they, the, I get in the company, the less effective that message is delivered to me personally. It may work for other people, yeah. but uh, maybe they're doing a good job of communicating to the broader audience. But that's 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 where the message I get is I I relate so much better to my manager, my teammates, my skip level manager. Get three or four levels above, it becomes less relevant to me, and that messaging doesn't sink in at all. Yeah, and part of us at at that level, three four levels above us, that they're solving different problems, right? They're thinking yeah. about things in different ways, and it does, and that it, communication it gets it a does affect more difficult. me. But I, I sometimes I wonder if it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number eight is body and brain. I know you're passionate. So good about leaders this are inclusive. Good leaders are inclusive and prioritize physical, mental, and emotional health. Right. So certainly promoting physical and mental well-being, uh, but also we need all types of bodies and brains in the workplace. You know, when we talk about human genetics, we talk about genetic diversity. Right. We need genetic diversity as humans procreate in order to keep the, the gene pool healthy. 
right? And you get genetic uniformity and the gene pool, almost, the gene pool can die. Yeah. The same thing is true in our workplaces, right? We, a lot of company, well, uh, some companies talk about the idea of culture fit, but the problem with culture fit is it's looking for genetic uniformity, right? And th this might be controversial, but I really think that culture fit is inherently discriminatory because it's too easily influenced by unconscious bias, prejudice, stereotypes, things like that. It's, I, I, I've heard managers say before, yeah, within 30 seconds, I know if they're a good fit or not. And I'm just like, there, there's no way that's possible. At, at that point, your, 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 you know, prefrontal cortex, your cerebral cortex hasn't even started the process. You're operating from, you know, this kind of gut instinct, which is too easily swayed by other factors that shouldn't be part of the equation. Yeah, I think um, there's a, a tendency for people to hire someone that's like themselves some of the things like themselves, maybe even some totally. that looks like themselves, but, but certainly acts and speaks like themselves. And uh, that's, there's nothing inherently wrong with that of getting people like, on, you know, that are team players, uh, but you deny yourself this diversity of, uh, of opinions and thoughts and experiences that you just talked about. Yeah. And people who think differently, solve problems differently, have different perspectives on the world, uh, minorities, Right. How many AI visual AI companies have been in trouble because everyone on their team was white and their software didn't work on black skin? Yeah. Right. When you when you don't have that diversity of people within your organization, uh, you're missing a lot of perspective and wisdom and experience that you really need. I see next is human needs. We're getting to the bottom of the list. Yes. Yep. Good leaders make sure their people's needs are taken care of. So at, at a general level, it encompasses things like food, water, housing, sleep, rest, health care. You know, are we paying our people enough to live? Are we allowing them to get enough sleep? You know, if, if you're doing, you know, 18 hours a day for months on end, you're doing something wrong, right? right. Sleep is when sleep is so critical for our brains. Uh, when we sleep, there are processes that happen when we sleep that don't happen any other time. And in fact, as we sleep, the, the myelin sheaths that surround our nerves to help them communicate better and whatnot open up and the brain kind of pulses to flush out waste via the endocrine system in the brain. Um, it, that only happens when we're asleep. A lot of movement from short-term to long-term memory happens when we sleep. Uh, there's a lot of sleep is really, really important. And without it, our bodies start to honestly shut down yeah but I, it, it, sleep so is priority supporting well it wasn't always for me and you know you may remember back in the day i was people thought i never slept and uh, uh -huh. i didn't sleep enough i was always going 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 when i first met number you were chugging back, energy drinks. Oh, two and one in each hand on the at the podium <laughs> giving a talk yeah oh man i cut those out like a decade ago Good half a you. decade a while ago <laughs> And I don't regret them at all. And now I prioritize sleep. Like it's, it's really, it's so important. And the last one, 10 is strengths. And, and it's broader than that. It's gifts, strengths, talents, intelligences, skills. People come to us with all sorts of, of, of things that they're good at and talented at and innately and learned and, you know, good leaders help people thrive and reach their potential as their authentic selves. Right. And, you know, we all have things we're good at and things we aren't, you know, there's things I'm really good at and there's things I really struggle with. And there are things that energize us and things that drain us. Right. And I think good leaders really help recognize and utilize their team members strengths so that people can focus on the stuff that they're good at, the stuff that energizes them, the stuff that thrives as, as much as possible. Right. Can we build a good team where, Hey, you know, I'm really, I'm good at A and I suck at B and you're great at B and you suck at A. Let's work together. That's an ideal environment, right? Yeah. Again, roles versus capabilities. You know, it's also encouraging personal growth and learning and development, you know, going to conferences, talks, whatever, you know, buying books, helping people grow as people uh, is really valued by employees and it's really good leadership to grow your people. Totally agree. Is there an order to this list? Is it are the ones at the top more important than the ones at the bottom, or um, 
Is there any structure to it? Kind of, but it's a little complex. There's a, a visual I have um, in one of my PowerPoint decks. Um, they're all kind of important. I mean, they're all important at some level. And they're all interconnected as well. I know for me, I mean, I, I'm autistic. I was diagnosed at uh, 33 years old here in Seattle. Um, and growing up, I didn't have a single friend until high school. And it's not that I didn't have close friends. I didn't have any at all. And somewhere around high school, uh, after high school, a little bit of college, I discovered computers. And oh, man, like I sat down at a computer like, this is how my brain works. It makes sense. Uh, your calling and right I taught myself enough to fake. I taught myself enough to fake my way into my first junior level job. <laughs> and um, but shortly thereafter, I found the Microsoft developer community. And I found that it was a Philly.net user group back when I was living in the Philly area. And I found other people who also think like me. And, and you know, over time, then I started speaking and speaking more and I became an MVP. And now it's, you know, you and I both, we know people all over the world. That's a weird blessing. And that all stemmed from, yeah. And that all stemmed from having a strength in, in computers. Uh, not to be stereotypically autistic, not everyone's in the computers, but I was. <laughs> and um it all stemmed from that. And through computers, then I was able to get positive social connection. I was able to get mission and purpose with work. Uh, I was able to earn money and get my needs met. And so they're all interconnected. I see. And so they're all equally important in that sense. Okay. Uh, well, what's, what's the, is there an overarching lesson here? What's, uh, can you bring it all together for us? Yeah, I think all the behaviors we want to see in the workplace, like cooperation, collaboration, innovation, adaptability, problem solving, productivity, proactiveness, all these positive behaviors come from a place where people feel safe, right? Where they're in their cerebral cortex or in their prefrontal cortex, they feel safe. And so many of the organizational challenges we see and the quote, bad behavior yeah, it stems directly from people not feeling safe. You know, I, I really do believe that people act, people behave well when they can, right? That people aren't giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. And this decade plus of study of the stuff has really kept reiterating this point again and again. If, if someone's having a hard time, we need to dive deeper and understand what's really going on for them. Yeah. But I think overall, good leaders understand the principles we've discussed and, and use that knowledge to ensure their people feel safe. And that, that's the body of line. That's the bottom line. Okay. That, you know, at that neurological level, at that brain level, do our people feel safe so people and organizations can thrive? Awesome. Uh, you mentioned your blog earlier. Are you, you're, you're writing about this quite a bit, aren't you? A little bit. I have a blog at uh, lookingforbears.com. Looking for bears. I like it. Yeah, there's a whole story on there. It's somewhere on the blog. It's somewhere on the website. There's a story about how that name came to be. Um, and uh, you, you told me that you're doing some other writing as well. Is that right? I've I've been talking about this stuff for a while and doing keynotes and various things. And everybody keeps saying I need to write a book. So I'm uh, I'm in the kind of worst draft stage of writing a book. <laughs> Did you say the first draft or the worst draft? <laughs> worst draft. I, I love that idea because, you know, I, I tend to be a perfectionist, right? It comes from my own experience. I just write out whatever comes to the page is going to be the worst. It doesn't matter. That's the point. All right. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sharing this with us. And um, uh, I'm, I've got your blog up right now. I'm going to read through it. And um, you stay safe. <laughs> I love how technology helps me be connected to my friends.